Vienna, Austria, 1938, the eve of the Second World War. Adolf Hitler holds the power of life and death in this city. Yet 30 years before, he shuffled through these same streets, a penniless and embittered vagrant who seemed destined for obscurity from the day of his birth. Adolf Hitler is born on April 20, 1889, in Braunau, an Austrian town on the German border. His mother, Clara, a former household servant, coddles and spoils her frail son. Under her influence, he becomes a choir boy at a Benedictine monastery. And young Adolf even talks about becoming a monk. Hitler's father, a customs official, is cold and domineering. When he hears that Adolf wants to study art, he snarls, an artist, never as long as I live. Hitler is a troublesome, mediocre student, but he'll blame his teachers, calling them half man, absolute tyrants. At 16, he quits school, celebrates by getting drunk, and becomes a loafer for the next three years. Finally, Hitler is lured to Vienna, a city that sparkles with culture and pleasure. But not for Hitler. Through four humiliating years, he lives as a bum in flop houses, eating in soup kitchens. While wandering the streets, he complains, hunger is my faithful bodyguard. He paints amateurish pictures and wallows in self-pity because he can't sell them. And then suddenly there comes what he calls his deliverance. Standing in a huge crowd, Hitler hears the official declaration of World War I. And he says later, I sank down on my knees and thanked heaven. For Hitler, the war is an escape from years of frustration. He said later, I went over the top with rejoicing and laughter. he revels in the carnage. He recovers in a hospital after being wounded, and he is awarded the Iron Cross for bravery. But his fellow soldiers despise him for his twisted love of war. Hitler returns to a post-war Germany that is seething with violence. The German people are humiliated by their defeat. Riots and revolt flare as communist, socialist, and reactionary groups clash for power. As a paid informer for the German government, Hitler spies on a group of shabby radicals called the German Workers' Party. But instead of informing on the group, he joins them. Hitler finds an excitement in revolutionary scheming that makes up for the hollowness of his own life. Hitler is ruthless, a fiery street corner agitator, and he soon takes command of the party. Its name is changed to the National Socialist, or Nazi Party, and its program is designed to lure the disgruntled lower classes. Take from the rich, Hitler says, and help the poor. We must build a strong new Germany, he tells the defeated nation. When he speaks or writes, he is obsessed with words like eternal struggle, mastery, war, and blood. To be a leader means to sway the masses, he says, and I have no equal in swaying the masses. He organizes a gang of street brawlers, bullies, and misfits as his own private army, the Brown Church. Their job, to crack skulls, to terrorize political opponents. With these stormtroopers, Hitler becomes a minor but dangerous political figure in Germany. This new sense of power intoxicates Hitler. An incredible scheme begins to take shape in his mind. Although he has only a few thousand followers, he vows that he will personally overthrow the government. He will become dictator of all Germany. In 1923, after a political meeting in a beer hall, Hitler leads his stormtroopers through the streets of Munich. The national revolution has begun, he declared.
when a detachment of a hundred policemen breaks up the march, and the fiasco, the Munich Putsch, ends in Hitler's arrest. The would-be dictator is tried for treason. He is convicted and sentenced to five years in prison. But through political influence, he serves only eight months in jail, in a private cell. And he writes a strange book called Mein Kampf, My Struggle, which is published after his release. It's a mixture of crackpot history, anti-Semitism, and his own fantastic scheme to rule not only Germany, but all of Europe. But at first, nobody pays attention to Mein Kampf. Hitler himself is looked upon as something of a national joke. For the time being, Germany is in no mood for a political hoodlum with a Charlie Chaplin mustache. But Hitler is determined to carry out his extraordinary plan, and he goes about the task of rebuilding the Nazi party. His brown shirts are a special haven for deviants, thieves, blackmailers, and murderers. They are his hard core. But in time, Hitler begins to lure thousands of followers. He promises to restore Germany's greatness, to build a mighty army. Only force rules, he says. Struggle is the father of all things. Virtue lies in blood. In the eyes of these people, Adolf Hitler is becoming a man of destiny. And as each day passes, he feels that the power he craves is nearly within his grasp. At the age of 38, this man of destiny develops a twisted passion for his 20-year-old niece, Geli Raubel. Neurotically possessive, he forbids her to leave his side to live a life of her own. But one day in 1931, the despairing girl commits suicide. Hitler is guilt-stricken, but he has no time for mourning. The moment has come when he must hurl himself into a power struggle for control of a collapsing Germany. Five million workers are unemployed. The weak, middle-of-the-road government is paralyzed by the crisis. Hitler exploits the emergency by fomenting demonstrations and riots. At the same time, the Communist Party unleashes a wave of violence. Well, they too plan to pick up the pieces when the Republic falls. Hindenburg, the president of the Republic, is 84 years old. His mind is failing, and the government he leads is hopelessly indecisive, corrupt. Although he detests Hitler, the ailing Hindenburg is forced to make deals and compromises with the treacherous Nazi party. After meeting with Hindenburg and his representatives, Hitler boasts, now I have them in my pocket. In 1932, Hitler takes a daring step. He campaigns against Hindenburg for the presidency. We do not need an uprising, says Hitler. Democracy must be destroyed with the weapons of democracy. But in a free election, the Germans still prefer a senile Hindenburg to a potential dictator like Adolf Hitler. Furious at losing the election, Hitler now resorts to violence to undermine the Republic and to increase his own power. His brown shirts start a new wave of political riots, even murders. In desperation, Hindenburg takes a fatal step. He tries to fight evil with evil. He appoints first one, then another political cutthroat to the key office of Chancellor, giving them virtually dictatorial power. Iron rule, Hindenburg field, may save the nation and prevent Hitler from taking over. But the new chancellors are too weak to cope with the crisis. Finally, Hindenburg capitulates to Hitler and presents him with the key office of chancellor. Hindenburg thinks he'll be able to use and control the Nazis and their leader. But Hitler has other ideas. February 27, 1933. The Reichstag building goes up in flames, put to the torch secretly by Nazi stormtroopers. But Hitler blames it on a logical scapegoat, 
his old rival, the Communists. He warned that the Reichstag fire and the current national prices prove that Germany needs a strong leader. He demands absolute dictatorial power, and this time he gets them legally, handed to him by the German parliament itself. A nation's freedom is surrendered to a tyrant. Said one historian, the gutter had come to power. But millions of Germans hail Hitler as the man who can lead them to greatness. The others are either afraid to oppose him, or they just don't care enough. Germany is now under his heel. But Hitler lusts for more. He vows to himself that all of Europe will be his, no matter what the cost. Hitler is dictator of Germany. He has surrounded himself with a hard core of ruthless lieutenants. Hermann Goering, a former drug addict, will become economic dictator of Germany and head of the Air Force, the Luftwaffe. Goering is an intimate of industrialists and aristocrats, but he prefers the company of Hitler's street brawl. Propaganda minister and professional anti-Semite Joseph Goebbels in his earlier days, as a frustrated writer and socialist agitator, he has attached himself to Hitler's coattails. Goebbels once said, Adolf Hitler, I love you because you are both great and simple. These are the characteristics of the genius. Rudolf Hess, Hitler's right-hand man. He is a former street thug who fancies himself a deep thinker. The ideal leader, says Hess, is a man who does not shrink before bloodshed, who can trample people with the boots of a grenadier. With such men, Hitler sets to work. The Partei is Hitler. Hitler aber is Deutschland, wie Deutschland Hitler is. Hitler, Sieg! Sieg! must be burned because ideas are dangerous. The nation's press and culture must be controlled by the state. All other political parties must be stamped out. The Jews, a helpless minority, are persecuted in the name of Aryan supremacy. Their businesses are boycotted. They're beaten up in the street. They're driven out of public and professional life. Germany is becoming a nightmare state. Most Germans, however, prefer to ignore the mounting terror. Adolf Hitler is giving them what they want. He says he is a friend of the poor. He gives the unemployed jobs in public work projects. In armament production. It is true Hitler has smashed the trade unions and wages are controlled, but the working man now has economic security, and he complacently surrenders his freedom. The industrialists embrace it because they've been promised, and now they get enormous profits from building the Nazi war machine. Germany enjoys good times. Few Germans seem to care that they have joined ranks behind the political gangster who is now ready to set up his move on Europe. March 7, 1936. A small Nazi force marches into the industrial Rhineland, which had been demilitarized by the Versailles Treaty. This could be a suicidal bluff for Hitler. He knows that the French and British are not only strong enough to stop him, 
they could easily crush him and his entire Third Reich. But just as Hitler expected, his troops meet no resistance. The French and British are unwilling to risk war, a war they could easily have won. Elated by his Rhineland success, Hitler meets with Benito Mussolini, the dictator of Italy. He convinces Mussolini that together they can embark on daring military adventures and share in the spoils of war. With Italy as an ally, Hitler is ready to plot his next move. In the winter of 1937, Adolf Hitler holds a secret conference with his high command. He announces his decision to march on Europe. His generals are stunned. They warn that Germany is still too weak, that Britain and France can easily smash the German army. But Hitler can no longer control his ambition. March 13, 1938. Hitler's armies sweep through a helpless Austria. Once again, Britain and France do nothing. Hitler is sure now that he cannot be stopped. He makes a triumphant entry into Vienna, the city where he'd been a failure 30 years before. He is settling an old score. Adolf Hitler takes a perverse pride in the knowledge that because of him, all Europe stands on the brink of war. Munich, September 29, 1938. England and France desperately try to keep the peace. Britain's Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain and French Premier Edouard Daladier have come to meet with Hitler and Mussolini. Hitler demands that he be given the Sudetenland, almost one quarter of Czechoslovakia. Or, he warned, there will be war. Chamberlain wants to avert conflict at all costs. And he climaxes the long months of appeasement by throwing Czechoslovakia to the wolves. Hitler's appetite for conquest is apparently satisfied. Chamberlain returned to London without knowing that Hitler privately called him a little worm. Chamberlain tells his nation and the world, my good friend, there has come back from Germany to Downing Street, peace with honor. I believe it is peace in our time. Yesterday afternoon, I had a long talk with Herr Hitler. It was a frank talk. But it was a friendly one. And I feel satisfied now that each of us fully understands what is in the mind of the other. The settlement of the Czechoslovakian problem, which has now been achieved, is, in my view, only the prelude to a larger settlement in which all Europe may find peace. A dreadful darkness, however, is swiftly descending on Europe. The Soviet Union is the last real military threat that stands between Hitler and his plans for expansion. So in August of 1939, he makes a non-aggression pact with Stalin, a pact that stuns the world, a pact that leaves Hitler free to make his boldest move.
Brigade smashes through Poland. This is the beginning of the most terrible war in history. Hitler tells his people that the Germans will be the best of the races, that he'll lead them to greatness with tactics like steel. The Third Reich, he says, will last for a thousand years. Adolf Hitler is committed now to a desperate course. Either he must conquer all of Europe, or he and the Third Reich will be destroyed. and Czechoslovakia. Now, he tells his generals, further successes can no longer be attained without the shedding of blood. Hitler meets with his high command after the swift fall of Poland. He says, no one has ever achieved what I have achieved. The fate of the Reich depends only on me. He commands that the German armies march across Europe. France and Great Britain, he says, will be conquered. But Denmark, Norway, and Holland must come first. Hitler now unleashes devastating mechanized warfare upon them. And the three little nations are overwhelmed in the early spring of 1940. Then the Nazi Panzer Division push into Belgium, where they are challenged for the first time by French and British troops. The war is now engulfing all of Europe as the Allied armies wither under the German attack. Over 300,000 French and British troops retreat until they're trapped on the beach at Dunkirk, their backs to the English Channel. Hermann Goering, chief of the Luftwaffe, wants the glory of annihilating the surrounded troops at Dunkirk. He asks Hitler for permission, and he gets it. surrenders almost as quickly as Poland and Norway. This is springtime in Paris, in 1940. after the First World War. 
This scene was witnessed personally by a correspondent, William L. Shira. Hitler's face, he writes, is a fire with scorn, anger, hate, revenge, and triumph. Hitler calls this the greatest and finest moment of my life. Hitler again turns to his Luftwaffe, orders his air force to bring Great Britain to her knees. under the Nazi whip. But then the tide turns in the Battle of Britain. The outnumbered Royal Air Force challenges the mighty Luftwaffe, and the Nazis suffer staggering losses. The RAF saves Britain. Winston Churchill says, Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Stunned by this reverse, he is accustomed to quick victory. He decides the conquest of Great Britain can wait. Instead, he will turn to the east. He will break his non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union and invade Russia with what he calls unprecedented, unmerciful, and unrelenting harshness. The world, declares Hitler, will hold its breath. His German army has slashed through the Soviet Union, served toward Moscow and Leningrad. Occurring, between 20 and 30 million persons will die of hunger in Russia. Perhaps it is well that it is so, for certain nations must be decimated. This is Berchtesgaden, the mountain retreat in the Bavarian Alps, where Adolf Hitler escapes the savagery of war to spend tranquil interludes with his mistress, Eva Braun. She had been a shop girl when Hitler met her during his early rise to power. Few people in Germany know anything about her, for Hitler hides her from the public. When Hitler is away, she divides her time between her two main interests, popular novels and physical culture. Hitler has a peculiar relationship with Eva. He boasts to her of other romantic conquests. He forbids her to dance or sing in his presence. He drives her to attempt suicide twice. An ardent movie fan, Eva has a crush on the American actor Robert Taylor. She possesses what one observer calls a bird-like mind. And this does not displease him, for he has told a friend the greater the man, the more insignificant the woman. The battle on the Russian front permits the Fuhrer little time for the pleasures of Berchtesgaden. The Japanese attack Pearl Harbor, and this news staggers Hitler. He had hoped to keep the powerful United States out of the war for at least another year. Now, Hitler has no choice. He declares war on the United States. The German nation, he says, wants only its rights. 
and we will secure for ourselves this right to live, even if thousands of Churchills and Roosevelts conspire against us. The conqueror who ordered his Luftwaffe to slaughter defenseless civilians must now face the combined might of Great Britain, the Soviet Union, and the United States. And Adolf Hitler begins to understand that he is fighting for his life. Adolf Hitler is fighting on two fronts, in the Soviet Union and in North Africa. The pressures of war have begun to take their toll. His hair is turning gray. He tells his friend Goebbels that he suffers attacks of giddiness. Hitler is worried about the North African campaign. General Rommel's Africa Corps had been scoring brilliant victories. But now the desert fox is in trouble. He's running short on weapons and supplies. Hitler, in a fatal blunder, refuses to send more. Rommel wants to retreat, but Hitler issues an order. You can show your troops, he says, no other way than that which leads to victory or to death. Germany loses this duel in the desert, and this is the beginning of the end for Adolf Hitler. Hitler's next disaster comes at Stalingrad. The Red Army and the Russian winter take a staggering toll on the German army. Hitler's commanding general sends him an urgent message. Troops without ammunition, further defense senseless, collapse inevitable. But Hitler replies from his headquarters in Germany, surrender is forbidden, hold positions to the last man. When he learns that 90,000 Nazi soldiers have surrendered at Stalingrad, Hitler says they should have shot themselves with their last bullet. American troops liberate Rome in June of 1944 after invading what is called the soft underbelly of Europe. Hitler prepares now for the Allies' next blow, which he expects somewhere along the English Channel on the coast of France. He is confident that the German army can easily repel an attack. The entire coastline bristles with defenses, and Hitler proudly calls this barrier his impregnable Atlantic Wall. of June, 1944, the invasion at Normandy. Through misinformation and indecisiveness, the German high command is unable to beat back the greatest invasion armada in history. In the middle of that fateful day, Hitler, at Berchtesgaden, is given a briefing on the invasion. He issues a ludicrous command. The invaders, he says, must be driven into the sea not later than tonight. But in the days that follow, more than 300,000 Allied troops come ashore. impregnable Atlantic wall has collapsed.
shortly after D-Day. He doesn't know it, but a clique of German officers is sick of the war, disgusted with Hitler, and they plan to assassinate him that very afternoon. A war hero has planted a time bomb in a briefcase just six feet from Hitler's leg. Another officer, however, has accidentally moved the briefcase away from Hitler. Most of the officers in the room are killed or badly wounded in the blast. Hitler, however, escapes with severe burns and a partially paralyzed right arm. Later that afternoon, he meets Mussolini and tells him, having escaped death, I am convinced that the great cause which I serve can be brought to a good end. And Mussolini tells Hitler, what has happened here today gives me new courage. This is the last time they meet. Within a year, Mussolini's corpse will hang by its heels in the streets of Milan. The men who tried to assassinate Hitler are put on public trial. They are tormented by the prosecutor, by their own defense attorneys, and even by the judge, who will be described later as a vile, vituperative maniac. The defendants explain that they wanted to kill Hitler to put an end to Nazi atrocity. Don't get arrogant, says the judge. We'll do away with your kind. The judge calls them tramp and traitor. Hitler orders that the conspirators be hanged like cattle by piano wire attached to metal. Now the tempo of Hitler's savagery begins to mount. His concentration camps have become factories of death for five million European Jews and other so-called undesirables. German people are callous to the carnage going on in their midst. They join Hitler in celebrating his 55th birthday in 1944. Most of them will follow him blindly until the very end. The Allied armies are closing in on Hitler's Third Reich. The British and Americans from the west, the Russians from the east. Hitler is trapped. Germans counterattack in the winter of 1944. This Battle of the Bulge is Hitler's last desperate gamble. He says, we shall yet master fate. But his last gamble failed. The Allied armies push across the Rhine and into Germany. Hitler establishes new headquarters in an underground bunker at the Chancellery in Berlin, where he will finally marry his mistress, Eva Braun. He has already had several nervous breakdowns. The German officer says his face and eyes give the impression of total exhaustion. 
All his movements are those of a senile man. The Red Army penetrates the outskirts of Berlin, only a few miles from Hitler's bunker. Below ground, Hitler writes his last will and testament. Then the Fuhrer reflects on all he has done and calls it a glorious and heroic struggle. I die, he says, with a joyful heart. A Soviet cannon barrage demolishes the chancellery above his bunker. The next day, Russian troops press to within a block of Hitler's bunker. And as the street battle rages, Hitler and Eva Braun retire to a subterranean room. With the clatter of machine gun fire in their ears, Eva Braun takes poison, and Hitler puts a revolver to his mouth and pulls the trigger. Behind the shattered walls of the Chancellery, the bodies of Adolf Hitler and his bride are burned. give it up. They will have to carry away our dead body. Joseph Goebbels was right. When it was all over, people around the world expressed amazement at Hitler's actions. But really, in Mein Kampf and in his speeches, he had made his intentions clear right from the start. People just couldn't believe, or hadn't wanted to believe, that he would really go as far as he did. That's why today, when a leader anywhere seems headed towards a course of bullying their neighbors and purging ethnic minorities, it stirs an instant reaction. Our diverse often divided international community seems totally unified around one goal, never again in Adolf Hitler. For biography, I'm Jack Perkins. Thank you for watching.